Good morning, everybody who have joined us on this YouTube channel. A very warm welcome to all preparing for the FRCS Urology exam. As a continuation of Pediatric Urology Vivas, today's topic is undescended testis. The last audio which I made was on undescended testis, which was palpable on examination. Today's audio will be on undescended testis, which remains impalpable on examination. Please note that I have not taken any of these questions from any book and have made them up myself. A lot of urologists from all over the world have joined us on this YouTube channel. If you do know of any local urologist group or forum, please do share this link so that maximum people can get benefit out of it. So it is your exam day. Your first table is pediatric urology. You will be asked two scenarios on it, each of, two min each of 10 minutes duration. On approaching the table, make eye contact with both the examiners with a pleasant smile on your face and shake hands firmly. Have a seat, take the paper and pencil which is provided to you on the table and jot down the important points of the question examiner asks you. For example, the age of the baby and the gender of the baby. Examiner will then ask you, mom brings her 12 month old baby boy with right undescended testis. How will you assess him? So I will see the mom in a dedicated pedi pediatric clinic and will take focus history, noting down the age of baby, the risk factors as family history, low birth weight, prematurity, associated anomalies, and was the missing testicle ever present in the scrotum. I will then go on to perform an examination in the presence of mother in warm room, warm hands with chaperone, and will look at the general health of the child. We'll inspect the hemiscrotum, whether it is developed or not, whether the gonad is present or absent, and would, if it is absent, would check the inguinal region and the ectopic sites, and would also check the size of the contralateral testis. Would then go on to palpation to check if the testis is in the scrotum or not. And if it is uh, not, then I would milk along the inguinal canal to feel for the testis. If the testis is palpable, I will try to gently bring it down. If the testis remains impalpable, I will palpate the ectopic sites for any gonad. So the examiner will then ask you, on examination, the right testis is impalpable. What percentage of undescended testis are impalpable? About 20% of undescended testis are impalpable. And of these, 40% are abdominal, 30% the vas and ves vessels end blindly deep to the deep inguinal ring, in 20% the vas and vessels end blindly in inguinal canal, and in 10% the testis lies in the inguinal canal. And about 1-4% to the testis will be absent. So the examiner will then ask you where the intra-abdominal testis can be found. Well, it can be found close to the deep inguinal ring, or it can be found in the near the kidneys or in the retrovesical space or the abdominal wall. Then the examiner will ask you, you have taken the history and performed the examination on a 12 month old baby boy, but still the right testis remains impalpable while the left testis is normally descended. How will you proceed? I will explain to the parents that about 20% of the undescended testis are impalpable and in order to find out whether the testis is present or absent and its location, I will counsel the parents for examination under anesthesia plus minus diagnostic laparoscopy and proceed accordingly. So the examiner's next question would be, is there any role of imaging before the surgery in impalpable testis? To find whether the testis is located within the abdomen or truly absent or in the inguinal canal, ultrasound scan is unreliable and MRI scan requires sedation. Therefore, imaging is not indicated for the diagnosis of impalpable testis because of its limited accuracy. So for impalpable testis, examination under anesthesia and laparoscopy is the investigation of choice. And it is not only diagnostic, but also it is therapeutic. The examiner would then ask you, so um, how would a non-palpable testis be managed? What will you tell the parents? So I will tell the parents that about 20% of the undescended testis are impalpable. 
And so as to plan the treatment, we have to know whether the testis is apt, uh, absent in the abdomen or any of the inguinal canal. So uh, for this purpose, I would explain to them that the imaging is unreliable and MRI would require general anesthesia. So ex diagnostic laparoscopy preceded by examination under anesthesia is the gold standard investigation in not only diagnosing it, but planning the treatment and bringing the testis down. And we'll further use a BOUS information leaflet to explain the procedure, its alternatives, the complications, and further follow-up. And would we'll then also explain that if on examination under anesthesia, the testis becomes palpable in the groin, then I would go ahead with open and guinal orchidopexy, which has a risk of 2% uh, risk of testicular atrophy. And if on examination under anesthesia, the testis remains impalpable, then I would go ahead with diagnostic laparoscopy to locate the testis in the intra-abdominal region. And during diagnostic laparoscopy, there are a number of possibilities which can occur. One is that if an intra-abdominal testis of uh, 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 good quality is found, then either I can go ahead with one stage or two stage Fowler-Stevens orchidopexy, depending on whether the testis lies near the deep inguinal ring or far away from it. And in the two-stage Fowler-Stevens orchidopexy, we will perform the first stage at this point where the testicular vessels are clipped. And six months later, we come back and mobilize the testis down to the scrotum. The risk of testicular atrophy with the two stage is around 8%. And if the testis is high up and can't be brought down, then I have the option of orchidectomy also in this case. The second possibility is that if the vase and vessels are blind ending, then nothing needs to be done as this signifies a vanishing testis which is due to intrauterine torsion and contralateral orchidopexy may be performed. The third possibility is that if vase and vessels are seen entering the deep inguinal ring, then I would go ahead with inguinal exploration to look for either a viable testis or a testicular nubbin, which I would excise if a testicular nubbin is found. If you cannot find a vase or vessel, then what are you going to do? Then I would like to look high up, as high as the kidneys to locate the testis. So uh, this is how I'm going to counsel or uh, ex explain to the parents. Then the examiner would ask you, can you classify the undescended testis for me? Undescended testis can be classified as palpable and impalpable. About 80% are palpable and impalpable are 20%. You mentioned about examination under anesthesia. What is the relevance of examination under anesthesia? Well, examination under anesthesia in this, uh, the previously impalpable testis can become palpable when the child is more relaxed and asleep. And where will you examine? In examination under anesthesia, we'll examine the normal line of descent as well as the ectopic sites. And how will you perform the surgery? Well, after con counseling, consenting in an adequately prepared consented rape patient uh, I, with the child supine, I will start with the examination under anesthesia and will try to find the testis in the inguinal region. And uh, if the testis becomes palpable in the inguinal region, then I will go ahead with the inguinal orchidopexy. If despite this examination under anesthesia, the testis remains impalpable, then I would proceed to diagnostic laparoscopy in which I will insert a camera port to look for the intra-abdominal testis of vase and vessels. If I find an intra-abdominal testis, then I can insert other ports and proceed with two-stage or one-stage Fowler-Stevens orchidopexy. So alternatively, the examiner can simply ask you that on examination under anesthesia, what different possibilities can be found? that if you found a testis in the inguinal canal, what will you do? You will proceed with the inguinal orchidopexy. If during examination under anesthesia, a nubbin is found, a very small testis is found in the inguinal region, then you would remove the nubbin and go for contralateral orchidopexy. And if on examination under anesthesia, the testis is still impalpable, what will you do? You will go ahead with the diagnostic laparoscopy. So um, during the next question the examiner can ask you is that during diagnostic laparoscopy, you find a testis near the deep inguinal ring. What next? You have the option of going for a single stage or a two stage Fowler-Stevens orchidopexy. A single stage would suffice over here. 
they can go on to ask you the different operations which are performed for um, uh, impalpable undescended testes. Well, impalpable and undescended testes or different options can be performed either laparoscopically or by open approach. These include a uh, single stage Fowler Stevens, a two stage Fowler Stevens, or an open trans abdominal orchidopexy, or a microvascular orchidopexy, or an orchidectomy. If they ask you that if the intraabdominal testis on diagnostic laparoscopy was found 3 cm away from the deep inguinal ring, what would be your next step? Well, I will opt for the uh, two-stage Fowler Stevens orchidopexy in this case. And uh, another uh, way I can uh, consider, think of this option is that I can try to mobilize this testis to the contralateral deep inguinal ring if I'm if it is possible to mobilize it to the contralateral deep in guan ring, then it is possible to bring this testis down to the ipsilateral scrotum. So uh, this is uh, one way of how I can uh, find out whether one stage or a single stage or a two stage approach would be appropriate for this patient. And uh, any other way in which you can find out whether the intraabdominal testis can be brought down or not? Yes, if the testis is uh, less than 1.5 to 2 centimeters from the deep in guan ring, it can usually be brought down. Why do you think, uh, which one would you prefer, the one stage or the two stage uh, Fowler Stevens orchidopexy? Well, I would personally prefer the two stage Fowler Stevens orchidopexy because the salvage rate is higher as compared to the single stage. Then the examiner can ask you how is the first stage done and what is its rationale? So, well, in the first stage of Fowler Stevens orchidopexy, the testicular vessels are clipped and uh, uh, then we come back six months later um, where the co collateral circulation it becomes uh, more uh, substantial and proliferates and then we bring the testis and then these uh, the testis is brought down into the uh, fundus of the strotum and um, uh, kept in a subdartos pouch so what is the success rate of uh, two stage fowler stevens orchidopexy it is around 86% now the examiner here can ask you, um, can you describe the two, the second stage of Fowler Stevens orchidopexy, which I have already done for you, and why they they can ask you with that why do you need to wait for six months to perform second stage Fowler Stevens orchidopexy? That also I have answered in order for the collateral blood supply to become more substantial, uh, as that will improve the vascularity of the testis. They can then go on to ask you that after six months you come back. Uh, but uh, you try to mobilize the testis, but you still cannot bring it down. What other uh, methods can you use here? Well, you can use the micro microvascular autotransplantation uh, using microvascular orchidopexy in which the spermatic vessels are anastomosed to the epigastric vessels. And uh, then they can ask you that, uh, or they can alternatively ask you, are there any other surgical options uh, that is microvascular? Uh, autotransplantation and is there any other option yes orchidectomy is definitely an option if the vase is too short to allow the scrotal placement of the testis or if the testis is atrophic then they can ask you that uh, if, uh, if if you found out that the on diagnostic laparoscopy that the vase and vessels were entering an open deep inguinal ring and uh, then what would you do i would tell them that i am going to proceed with the inguinal exploration then they can ask you that uh, you have uh, dissected out everything and still you cannot, uh, you have uh, you've, uh, done the open inguinal uh, open inguinal exploration, you have dissected out all the tissues but still the cord cannot be brought down. Yeah, what, um, how would you still go for a Fowler-Stevens uh, orchidopexy at this point in time? So the answer would be no because you have extensively dissected out the cord and uh, um, it would not be possible for the collateral vessels to develop at this point in time. So the decision whether you want to go ahead with a Fowler-Stevens orchidopexy, uh, it should be taken early on in the course. Then the examiner can ask you, uh, what is the long-term follow-up for this patient? So um, you need to tell them that the, pa the parents should be instructed uh, or the patient as well as the parents should be instructed to perform a testicular self-examination on a regular basis starting at puberty 
because of the increased risk of testicular cancer in men with a history of undescended testis. I have already mentioned that uh, in a case of unilateral undescended testis, the paternity rate uh, for these men is the same as that of the general population, about 89 to 90% versus 94%. So the, as such, the paternity rate is not different from the general population. The malignancy risk uh, is uh, no doubt reduced, but it is not eliminated. So the testicular self-examination must need to be done. The examiner can then go ahead and ask you about the blood supply of the testis here. So you should be um, confident about the blood supply of testis that the testis uh, gets its blood supply from the testicular or the gonadal artery which in itself arises from the abdominal aorta, the def vas deferens artery which is a branch of inferior vesicle artery which arises from the internal iliac artery. And the third is a cremastric artery, which is a branch of inferior epigastric artery, which in itself is a branch of external iliac artery. So um, this is how this is the viva on an impalpable undescended testis. This is how a viva uh, will go. And remember that your answers should be precise and crisp so that in 10 minutes time, you're able to go through the entire uh, history, examination, investigations, treatment, complications of the topic which you are asked about. And uh, today I will also tell you how the marks are given on a scenario. Uh, each examiner gives you about three marks on one scenario, which ranges from four to eight. Four is a bad fail and uh, uh, five is fail, six is pass, seven is a good pass and eight is excellent. So what do the examiners score you on? Each examiner scores you on your knowledge and clinical reasoning and judgment, uh, on your communication skills and your logical thought process. And the third is your overall professionalism. So, uh, and uh, what is the total pass mark? Well, the pass mark uh, is, as I've told you, it ranges from four to eight and six is the pass. So each examiner gives you three marks on one scenario. Uh, and uh, so if the first examiner gives you six, 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 and the second examiner also gives you 666 six, six on the first scenario. That means that your score, you score 36 on one scenario. That is a pass. This way, there are 16 table vivers. So you just multiply this 36 into 16, and that comes to be 576. So the total pass mark for the entire um, exam is 576 out of a total of 768. So this is just a brief reca recap on how the scoring is done. And I hope that you enjoyed this audio on impalpable undescended testis and found it ho uh, and found it helpful. And I will be posting more audios soon. So please do subscribe. And thank you very much for joining in. Thank you.